Good morning. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see you guys and certainly welcome to Austin. We are presenting on architecting application workloads for OpenStack Clouds. So we're gonna do a quick round of introductions. My name is Megan Rossetti, and I am with the Cloud Operations team at Walmart. I'm Samir Adhikari, and I'm at the Cloud Engineering team at Walmart, too. And I'm Craig Starrett, and I'm with Intel, and I'm part of the Open Source Technology Center. So what we want to talk about a little bit today is a quick overview and introduction, and then two workloads that we have been working on um, continue to kind of go through, the e-commerce workload and the web services workload. Um, then we want to go through a summary and make sure to leave enough time for Q&A at the end. All right, I'm going to jump right into the introduction. So the workload reference architectures are a series of documents that have been created by the Enterprise Working Group. We have received a lot of feedback through the community that the reference architectures was something enterprises have been looking for. So we started with the web services and the e-commerce e applications. Um, something that you will see in the diagrams, we strive to make sure that these are vendor neutral, agnostic, um, very focused on OpenStack and components to support the workloads that we have shown. And then where applicable, we have heat templates. These are, the diagrams are things that we are building out. It's a living document, it's currently in process. We're certainly revamping how we're looking at it, what we're moving on to the next couple of stages. So heat templates, um, we'll go through briefly. As I mentioned, these are living documents. Um, we're very open to feedback, kind of your thoughts, your ideas on what we've presented today and how to make it better. And we'll also talk a little bit about um, our next steps as well. Um, and priority. We've started with a couple of, of workload uh, diagrams. We'll get into what we're looking at next step. And then we'd really like your feedback on where things are, kind of where we're headed, and as a community, what you would like to see as well. And then we have a link included for where the current sample configurations are. And I'm going to turn it over to Samir. Thank you, Megan. So before I actually start talking about the reference architecture, um, one disclaimer. Like any good movie, this is inspired by a true story, uh, Walmart's e-commerce. But like any good story, there is some creative licensing here. So do not assume that this is exactly Walmart's e-commerce architecture. So um, the, all of you probably have shopped online in this day and age. And, but to just reiterate, fundamentally when you go to a website for any retailer, you look for products, you find something you like at the price you like, and then you buy it and then you obsessively check how soon it is getting to you. So the architecture that I'm going to talk about fundamentally addresses those things, and it probably has ideas for other architectures too. Uh, do not constrain yourself to just think that it is for e-commerce. So um, the goal of this presentation is to highlight the different OpenStack components that can be put in place for such an architecture. And uh, we use some of these components at Walmart. We don't use some of these components at Walmart, even though you'll see them at the picture. But uh, the way uh, we have tried to organize it is to give a logical view that if you are assembling these pieces together, how do they interact with one another? and how do they uh, sit with one another. So without further ado, I will actually go to the big picture. I will leave the slides for your consumption later. And my apologies up front for people in the back because of trying to fit so many things on the slide. You'll probably not uh, make out the font very well out there. But uh, I'm going to start from the 
from the left and work my way to the right. Uh, so when a customer sends in a request, there is a global load balancer which routes those requests. Uh, the request could technically be routed to multiple data centers. Uh, this picture, you can think of it as being partially replicated across multiple data centers. Some of these components might actually just sit on one, uh, but almost all these components have to exist in some form or the other. So once uh, the request gets routed to a web server, we have a whole suite of web servers which are just essentially generating the web page that you actually see. And by web page, I also mean the mobile app out here or the desktop web page that you see. Uh, but uh, in today's world, pretty much it's rare to have a purely static web page which comes to you. It is generated off of a template. So there's a whole suite of servers doing that part. But behind the scenes, uh, the next layer, which, we, uh, which I've titled services, is fundamentally a huge bunch of microservices. So each of them effectively does one function. So when you're browsing for a product, uh, you know, the browse services, which is essentially responding for all the data. So all these services have to talk to each other to enable the actual workflow. And a large chunk of that communication is through a messaging layer, you know, which uh, you can use different potential solutions and uh, OpenStack provides you one, so you could use that. But uh, the key to take away from this layer is that uh, each microservice is isolated for the very reason that they can be developed independently as long as they're compatible, backward compatible with the previous features that they provide. And it helps accelerate the changes you can do instead of having you know, one monolithic, monolithic layer at that point. So, Behind all this, apart from them talking through messaging, you actually need the data to serve all the requests. When, you, you know, when you're viewing a product, you need to pull in its price information. You need to pull in its uh, quantity that you have available. You know, that's how you show that of uh, limited items left. You potentially have to show other relevant data about customer reviews on that item. So all that, a uh, huge chunk of that comes from databases. You could uh, use Trove to run those databases. And uh, at the lowest layer, almost all of the things I've talked to so far are running as VMs, which Nova provides. Uh, but databases individually to store the data, you need block storage for those. And in e-commerce, or potentially in other cases, one of the biggest data needs is for images. All the images that you see on different web pages these individual microservices are going to just contain references to those images, but the, when the page is being rendered, all those images have to be loaded into the web page. So uh, there is a huge object store supporting all that, and you can use Swift for that. So this is the workflow, uh, transactional workflow that I talked about, and then there is an offline workflow, because when how do you show recommendations to the user? How do you show uh, related products? How do you, sh uh, you know, what matches? So all that analytics has to go on in the background, and you have to actually run another big data store and a lot of processing on that. And uh, so for that, uh, Sahara provides you some options. And uh, what I have uh, left out in the interest of time and in the interest of keeping it high level is that, you know, you don't have to have all these components together. You can plug and play, as I said, uh, uh, for the disclaimer up front, uh, for example, Walmart does not use every single component in here because based on your needs. But this will give you a frame of reference to, uh, to figure out that what of these pieces, and for even for a non-e-commerce architecture that you can uh, use. The legend below is fundamentally just talking about you know, the different uh, components that we are using, uh, NOVA or the different security groups which are being applied. Uh, and for a prevalent in all this, uh, Glance is there because that's how the VMs get their images. Keystone is there because without Keystone or Neutron, even Neutron for that fact, you cannot have a running OpenStack environment. So how this architecture maps to those is a discussion in itself which we leave out for now. 
and what issues come about, we'd be happy to answer questions related to that. At this point, I will hand it over to Craig for talking about web service. OK. So um, I'm covering the web services uh, architecture. And um, nowadays, there's almost an unlimited number of choices for your web services stack. And so for this example, we decided to go with the LAMP stack, which has continuously come up as the number one stack on OpenStack, uh, according to the OpenStack user survey. And so in general, um, just a quick overview of the, you know, we're looking at standard three-tier architecture. Um, you have a web presentation tier, so you have a cluster of web services to service the incoming requests. You have uh, application tier, which is doing the uh, main processing, and a database tier, which in this case is um, a MySQL database in a master-slave situation. Um, then you have uh, some kind of firewall or security rules that are doing some filtering uh, at, each of the at each of the network layers. And then a load balancer, um, both for the incoming requests and for the um, application servers. And then you want some kind of on-demand scaling and persistent storage for the database. And so this is how this all sits on top of your OpenStack cluster. So your OpenStack um, cloud has to serve certain background processes, and that's your keystone, your glance, your horizon, your heat, your celiometer in this case. Um, and then your three-tier architecture is mostly using your Neutron, Nova, and Cinder. And so we wanted to create a um, architecture that was horizontally scaling for both the web and the application tiers. Um, and so your user requests come in, and the first thing they do is they go into the load balancing as a service um, feature of Neutron. And for this example, um, we're actually starting with uh, LBAS version 1. Uh, it, although it was deprecated in the Liberty release, uh, LBAS version 2 wasn't supported in Heat until Mataka. So most of our testing has all been with LBAS version 1. And so the user requests come in, and LBAS uh, hands it off to one of the active web server nodes. Um, and then the web server hands it off through another LBAS again to one of the active application nodes. Uh, and then the database is a MySQL database with a master and slave setup. Let's see. Oh, so um, we also uh, we created uh, heat templates for all of this. And so the heat is, uh, we have auto scaling groups set up for the web tier and the application tier. And um, Celiometer on the OpenStack cloud is monitoring the overall activity on each of the nodes and looking for, um, in our case, CPU utilization, although the Celiometer meters support um, disk I.O., they support uh, memory utilization, they support uh, network I.O., so you can trigger on all sorts of things. And when those celiometer um, meters or alarms trigger, that then triggers heat to auto-scale and, and create an additional instance to meet the user demand. Um, for example, we also create downscaling groups. So if your activity drops and um, you have more resources than necessary, you can use heat to downscale your nodes, heat and celiometer, and that will reduce your overall expenses and reduce uh, resource consumption. So for these, like I said, we've created heat templates. And so for the example, for the, um, we're writing them in hot format. Um, uh, heat does also support CFN format, but in our case, we're writing them in hot format. And the heat template basically sets up three private networks. It'll set up the LBAS and your security groups to do port-based filtering for each of the private networks. And then create your auto-scaling groups and set up all your celiometer alarms. And then heat will automatically spawn and configure your web apps and, and database server. And so for this 
um, example, uh, we decided to use kind of an on-the-fly build. So you can either um, do store a single server image in Glance and then retrieve that and do an on-the-fly build where you install all of your individual applications and processes. Or if you want, you can build uh, customized images for your application, your web server, and your database server and store each of those separately. And they both have some advantages and disadvantages. Um, Pre-configured images spin up faster, but you need to make sure that you um, take care of any licensing issues as, as the instance boots up. Um, so in this example, it's just a sample of the heat template. Um, you can see that uh, in user data, we're passing into cloud init all of the uh, commands in order to do the updates and installation of the web, Apache web server. And then this is just a quick sample of auto scaling. Um, and so it'll set up a web scaling group and it'll set up web scale up policies and CPU alarms. And so Celiometer will automatically alarm if CPU in this case uh, exceeds 50% and then trigger uh, an additional instance to spawn off. And when we actually release the heat templates, they'll be fully documented to the point where anybody, even without heat experience, will be able to easily follow along and understand what's going on. Thank you. Certainly understand probably one of the biggest questions will be where can we find this documentation? Um, we are in the process, actually, of building out where these will land. Um, right now, we're looking at adding them off of the sample configuration page, um, but that is something that we're asking for your input and your feedback on how would you like to see and be able to process this information. And also along the lines of, does this information, what we've presented today, meet um, needs for adoption? Uh, questions about, I need some type of architecture to get started, and do you, these diagrams fulfill those needs? Mainly, are we headed in the right direction? So, how you can help, because we definitely are, are looking for your help, encourage uh, any and all feedback. Um, in addition to these two, we have others that we're working on. Um, the next one that is um, close to completion is big data. And then we do have others in the pipeline as well. That is a question I'd certainly like to hear back from the audience on what other reference architectures would you like to see in addition to the ones we've, we've put together and, and the ones that we're working on? What are areas of interest? Um, we need to certainly prioritize out which ones people feel would be most uh, useful, most relevant to the work at hand. And naturally, feedback can all go through the Enterprise Working Group. The Enterprise Working Group was founded to help with enterprise adoption. And when we first started, we identified different barriers to adoption. So through that, we've been working um, across many different companies and many different layers and partnering with uh, several other working groups to move enterprise adoption forward. Um, we meet weekly. We have a wiki page. Um, and then also a mailing list as well. So please feel free to join our meetings, send us an email, however you would like to uh, reach out and contact us. What we would like to do is turn it over for uh, Q&A and also your feedback. Really want a good understanding of how, how does this meet your needs? Is it what you're looking for? and what are some other areas that you would be interested in. So I do know we have a mic stand right here um, for anybody who has questions. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you, Samir. Um, you chose object store for your images. Um, can you elaborate why object store for images versus file storage? And uh, what did you use for your analytics? The second? Uh, you had an Yeah, object store, store for um, images, and then? Analytics. You analytics. analytics, OK. 
So uh, objects for images, fundamentally, uh, when the product images don't change much, I mean, once in a while they might get updated, but they're never edited on the fly, certainly. And uh, because, you know, uh, if you think of Amazon, which potentially has a, a few tens of millions of SKUs of products, or if, uh, sorry, uh, Walmart, and if you think of Amazon, which has about 200 million SKUs of products, if you look at those uh, environments, uh, the image for a product uh, pretty much will stay consistent for generations of the product. What you need are good tools to be able to change them when the product changes. Uh, the, uh, so object store fits that use case very, uh, very well. Uh, you, uh, you design the system to pick the object out, but you, what you don't know is the access pattern for that object. Right? You don't know that the object has to be loaded on the page but broadly, but you don't know that which objects at any given point of time customers are interested in viewing. So uh, in a file kind of a scenario, uh, you, can, you, you can design out scale out solutions with object store much better than you can design with file solutions. And uh, so not changing them much, being able to scale out very quickly to, with very low to latency load the page, essentially what drives the need for the object store there. And for the analytics cluster, uh, so the, there is a certain amount you need uh, live to maybe potentially detect. Uh, what you need live is essentially to get an interest, idea of the consumer's interest or intent to be more precise. Uh, what are they looking for? And that data is only built up over time because most of the time when these uh, commerce sites show you related products, that is based on you know, some, essentially uh, some form of a summarization over aggregate statistics collected over time of lots of consumers. And similarly, you want the, the, the critical need there is that you don't necessarily need the 100% accuracy on what product you're going to show the user. What you need is that quickly show him something or her something which they can pick out. So a lot of that processing, because it involves a lot of different sources, you might be ingesting uh, social media data, you might be, uh, your traffic patterns of your website, uh, you know, other uh, data sources that you can find, uh, competitor prices, uh, so many things. So that processing take, uh, first of all, that data ingestion, ingest, in, ingestion takes time, and then the processing take time, uh, which essentially at the end of the day, what you have to come up with is a matrix which you can quickly look up based on a user from a certain location, maybe a certain time of day, or uh, the product they are currently viewing. You have to pick a row in a table somewhere which will relate other potential products that the user can buy. So all that uh, number crunching essentially takes time. Uh, it's very hard to do it live. Live stuff you can only do incremental. You can never do the whole uh, data store analysis which, you, which is necessary for showing those correlations. So it's, uh, but architecturally, the way, uh, you know, the implementation of the analytics cluster, so that is why it's very intense. Uh, you tend to use, uh, there's a lot of I.O. demand uh, for moving the data around in that. So there the solution tends to put, uh, usually be bare metal. And uh, even if you run a NOVA VM on top, uh, if physically to do the processing part, the to handle the I.O. needs, uh, you you effectively expose the bare metal blocks to the NOVA machines. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other question? Could you repeat that? Sorry. Oh, what do we know about the next uh, reference architecture uh, on big data that is coming? I haven't uh, looked at it yet. Uh, do you know who's working on it by any chance on the top of your head? It's still a work in progress. Well, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. The big data is still a work in progress. Uh, what we are looking at is not only the reference architecture, but then building out some documentation. Um, and they're right in the midst of going through that I don't have an exact date of when that'll be released, but the big data is the next one to be released. Do you think that we're on track with what we're looking for? Because we'll, right now we're having big data follow that model. Is that something that would be of interest? Do you think that we're headed in the right direction at least with that?
But on the two that we have here. So with the two, with the e-commerce and the web tier, do you feel that those are on track with what you would be interested in or what you would be looking for? Uh, definitely, yeah. Okay. Okay. And that's, that's great feedback. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, one question. Uh, are there any plans to implement the reference architecture for CI/CD pipelines? Uh, for example, like open, one of the largest OpenStack cloud consumers is OpenStack itself. And I would be happy to see the reference implementation of OpenStack infra, like Garrett, Zool, uh, all the built pipelines of OpenStack as a reference architecture for enterprises building the SICD. Perfect question. I was thinking if there were no more, I would raise that as a comment. So what I didn't talk about at here is how you deploy all these pieces, right? It's a whole complex system. And one of the challenges, even if you have OpenStack running, is deploying all these other things. So uh, for that, uh, I think the good news or the bad news, depending on how you want to take it, uh, Walmart uses uh, a different, uh, its own application lifecycle manager, which we have open sourced, and you should check it out. It's called OneOps. And that what, uh, uh, you know, uh, what it does really is hides the fact that OpenStack is what the developers are writing against. So uh, we do, uh, to deploy OpenStack itself, we use OpenStack Ansible. And uh, we, uh, we don't use the OpenStack infrastructure pipeline to deploy OpenStack, because uh, we tend to deploy stable releases. And uh, if anybody in Walmart wants to contribute, it is done outside of what is deployed in our environment. But for deploying all these big pieces, a developer, what the interface that OneOps provides are, so there could be different solutions. I'm talking about ours is that the developer gets to, goes to the application lifecycle manager, or uh, logs in uh, based on their internal credentials, Walmart credentials, and then they tell the uh, OneOps tool that, hey, I am going to deploy a three-tier app. Because each of these components internally can be multiple tiers too. And this is a very, very high level view of the reference architecture. And uh, they say, okay, I need a Apache Tomcat, component, I need a Java component, I need a certain uh, database component. And then the orchestration tool actually kicks off VMs, does the install. So we still follow the model of doing installs on the VMs. So we don't do, uh, it's not pre-built or baked into images. So uh, the VMs come up, the tool it does the installs. Uh, and when you're, and the tool also allows you to pick choices like I want uh, a load balancer, I want block storage, I want uh, uh, failover capabilities, all those things are, are interfaces in the tool. And uh, once you pick and choose, then the orchestration tool talks to uh, OpenStack, brings up the VMs, and does all that. Sounds really similar to what Murano does in OpenStack. Pardon? Uh, that's what you're describing sounds really similar to what Murano does in OpenStack. Mm -hmm. It does. Uh, and so any other questions? Or that, first of all, does that address all you asked for? OK. Any other questions? A bit far from my phone, but um, Walmart also has this video service called Voodoo. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if they're running on OpenStack or not, but I was wondering whether or not anyone is looking at you know, coming up with a commoditized version of the um, metadata transformation and the transcoding services required to run one of those. So uh, I, am I have talked about the reference architecture, which maps to walmart.com, first to answer part of your question about, he asked uh, Voodoo, uh, to repeat it for everybody else. So Voodoo does video, and which involves, depending on the device, you know, you have to serve out the same content in different manners. So there's associated metadata and transformation of the videos. When people do fast forward or rewind, uh, all those actions require some background processing. So um, I personally don't have insight into how Voodoo does it, or because this is the area I focus on. And uh, but uh, there are uh, uh, invariably they they would involve a lot of processing and a lot of storage, even more than the images potentially, depending on the catalog of movies. So yet. Uh, 
A non-answer to your question is I don't know. Uh, Sorry. Um, to answer your question, so I'm part of the working group as well. So we do actually look at the media transcoding and distributions workload in the pipeline. So just um, um, follow up with the um, sample configurations. We, on, in the next couple of months, we will be working on the big data, starting from a simple configurations, and we probably also look at the media transcoding and see how we can use media, um, the OpenStack components to support the media transcoding and distribution workload. So I guess uh, that gives you the motivation to go look at the reference architectures. <laughs> Please. Hello. I have sort of, a, I guess would be a non-standard question for you. Um, I'm curious, given that we have an enterprise working group and we're doing reference architectures, um, reference architectures in enterprise are used for lots of different reasons. For architects, they're used as a way to kind of jumpstart something and move it forward. But they're also used in the executive level and the management level to kind of paint a picture of what you can do with the solution. And they also are used in economic analysis to try to figure out what is the capital cost, what is the scaling cost of something. Which of those things are you focusing on as a group? So I think this one, I will let either Leong or Megan answer. <laughs> Initially, what we're looking at is more of a jump start. Um, because we, we've had some sample configurations, but we've been asked for much more detail. And then the next step is to look at particular use cases. So it's a jumping start. It's a jump off kind of a, a start for these. Where do we need to go next? And do we look at building out different use cases than around the reference architecture? Because you're absolutely right. You bring up three really strong scenarios um, that people can use those for, or um, they can use them in combination with um, other ideas or models as well. So it's a starting point, but I agree we, we do need further development. And then your feedback is um, exactly what we need to make sure that we're online with what's really going to be the best, the best use for putting a lot of work into the reference architectures and making sure that they're easily consumable for businesses for enterprise needs, um, which can vary greatly depending on what they're looking for, what they're building out, scale, and so on and so forth. But more of a starting point at this at right now, and then uh, hopefully in six months to a year, we'll have a much different answer. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, great. Don't think I see any other hands up to you guys. I don't see any. Okay. Well, just, done. just want to make sure. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate your taking your time to come and listen to us this morning. Thank you. Thank you.